Hi, I'm Randall, co-host of The Drumming Show. We're pleased to bring you episode one in four short chapters. Our guests are Scott Paulson and Barb Smith, professional steel drum players and educators from the Vermont Independent School of the Arts. Our host, Bob Sparadale, learns about the teaching careers, the music school, and the travels of Scott and Barb. And there are hints of something special coming up in chapter four. By the way, if you want to watch the entire show in one piece as it was originally recorded, please visit us at cnow.tv. That's C-N-O-W dot TV. Now let's get started with Chapter 3, Scott Paulson and Barb Smith. Well, um, let's see, we're going to get to some playing. Uh, we're going to get to some playing soon, but uh, I want to ask you, I understand that you do a fair amount of travel. Can you tell us where you're bringing this music to? Who gets to hear all this and the teaching as well? Great question. Um, we are doing a fair amount of residencies. Some just me, some both of us. We had done one down in the Outer Banks of North Carolina a couple of years back with the whole school. It was fabulous. I uh, did one in central Vermont. I've got several more on the way, and it's sometimes it involves the whole school. But uh, we went to Key West, played down there last November. We try to, you know, if we can get out of Vermont in February, to bring, good thing. to bring our love of music together with our love of warmth. <laughs> to exercise these two things together. People. We like to do that when possible. So we are, we are going further flung and, and doing residencies and just performing. You know. We also do informances in schools. So we'll go in for one day and do small group workshops for maybe 45 minutes to an hour with either three or four classes at a time where we play steel drums and then talk about the history and the culture of the pan. and How they're constructed. Yep. So we can do a full week residency or two week residency down to a day where we just go in and talk to the kids and get them up and dancing and we have a lot of fun. Yeah. And the history yes. and the sociological impact of, mm. perhaps you could expand on that a little bit. That's so oh, it's interesting. A, it's a huge, it's a fascinating story. Well, steel drums came from Trinidad, and Trinidad until 1962 was under British rule, but the British only comprised 2% of the population, the rest being pretty evenly split between um, Afro and East Indian descent peoples. So the Brits were a little concerned that with drumming being so ensconced in both of those cultures, that there would be some signals sent back and forth organizing a revolt against the rulership. So before 1962, well, it was back in the early 1900s, they outlawed skin-headed instruments in Trinidad. You could not play a skin-headed drum or anything else. I don't know why they specified skin, because I guess that's what drumming was, all about the skins. But you could not play a skin-headed instrument. So the native Trinis, you know, it's, well, they're not going to be, you're not going to take drumming away from a people that just live for that, you know, as part of carnival and just their, their native cultures as well. So they started beating on trash cans, biscuit tins, car brake drums when cars came around. And they would parade these through the streets instead, especially right after World War II. It's a very recent invention comparatively to other wind, you know, brass, all kinds of instruments. So they... Uh, they had these, they called them, uh, uh, what did they call them? Well, it was first Tambu Bamboo, where they took these big shafts of bamboo and a smaller one, and they'd beat them in rhythm on the ground. They'd march with those. But then the metal kind of came along because it was louder. It carried further. You want your band to be louder than the next band. <laughs> you want to drown them out because it's, it's all about your band, right? So, but they discovered uh, through experimentation, trial and error, and eventually genius that if you, you know, beat that metal down and flip that over and pop part of it back from the other side, that little space now creates an actual pitch as opposed to being just a random noise or, you know, a clang. It actually produces a note. And, you know, a few different guys they start experimenting around. We get Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then this they is when start... they decided to use oil drums. Yes. And the father of that uh, was Ellie Manette, his name was. Um, who, oddly enough, eventually got hired by West Virginia University to come and teach steel drum playing and building. He's still there. He's still teaching. 
the tuner that comes to tune our drums is a student of his, worked with him for eight years, and even Ellie's father is still with us. So again, it's all it's all very recent. It's a very small world, the steel drum world. So and also socially, the early steel drum bands when they they formed were really more like rival gangs, and there was a lot of fighting between the different bands and you know over women and over you know, but because over time you know more uh, well a couple of things happened. They eventually got to take one of their steel bands over to Europe and play in Britain and more like college kids were starting to get, they wouldn't tell their parents, but they'd start <laughs> to sneak into the pan yards in Trinidad, you know, and eventually you started seeing young, you know, players that were better educated and whatnot getting into the bands. And over time, like this, the stature of steel bands kind of moved away from being, you know, gangs to more like organized. And they got sponsors, uh, Esso, which is now Exxon. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we're using oil barrels. Might as well right. you know, support these bands. And they started having contests for money. And now it is, you know, the symbol of national pride for Trinidad is the steel band. And interestingly, and interestingly enough, uh, there were so many oil drums on the island of Trinidad because in 1945, the United States had a Navy base. Right. And it became decommissioned after World War II. But there were piles and piles of oil drums. Destiny. Just discarded there. And they would, I think I remember a story about Ellie climbing over a wire fence just to take out these, <laughs> these oil drums so he can bring them back to the pan yard and make, and make pans. But it's really a story also besides the obvious social situation that was happening of recycling. Because otherwise those drums were just going to sit there. Well, and, and Trinidad is a very poor country. Yeah. And these, these people were going to make music some way. Yes. And here were all these oil drums sitting around. And who's to say that they were starting free. off in gangs, maybe they saw the light and improved their social status yes. and became more viable to society. Right. Well, being that it's the national symbol of pride, yeah, it mm. certainly worked. But it's very ingenious. And the, and the so, level of tuning now, if you were to see a video, say, from the 50s, you know, and the technique, and from a drumming standpoint, it's interesting as well because those early steel drum if, recordings, if you listen to them, the notes are a constant roll from one note to the other, and it's because they didn't have the science behind building the drums to understand how to, to at that point, to make them really bright, ringy, sustain. They were more like do, do. So if you wanted a longer note, it was All right. And so if you had something with more of a lyrical passage, you would just continually roll from one note to the next. Or now, I mean, you hit a nice, nicely tuned note on a steel drum, it'll ring for 20 seconds, you know, but it's, that's, they've changed the technique. They actually know how to shape the notes in such a way to reinforce the harmonics. You know, they're tuning with, now with stroke tuners that are not only hearing the fundamental pitch, but they're hearing, uh, say, five overtones above that, and they actually, the good tuners, know how to individually tune the overtones separate from the fundamental That's by amazing. the shape of the note, and it's all in the hammer. Kind of like a well-tempered piano. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's not just like making it a G. Yeah. A lot more to it. And people ask us all the time, do we tune our own instruments? And like, oh, mm -hmm. there's something about that eight years to get good at it thing that kind of put me <laughs> off, even though we do persevere as musicians. So that's a whole other thing, you know. Well, uh, I'm wondering uh, where do people go to hear some of your music besides this show? Well, I'm sure you've been playing a long time and teaching people and so forth. You must have CDs out, or do you have anything on the web that they can go to if they want to right now to, to find out? At this very moment, due to issues that we have no control over, <laughs> We had a very nice website, and it, but it's a type of one that our host no longer supports. And in fact, the people who design that style of website no longer support it. It went down like last month. But the links to our school and uh, islandtimesteel.com go to a temporary page where there you can go to our Facebook page and contact us. We do have CDs out, uh, two for our large steel drum band, the Panhandlers. One's called Vermont Tropic. <laughs> all one word and then we just recorded a live one called live at the tupelo which is, was recorded in white river junction vermont uh last october 
good live album. We're still working on our first one as a duo, so that isn't ready. It's got yet. very good reviews. Terrific. Well, uh, how far and wide do your students uh, come from? Do they come from you know just locally, from states away, or or when you travel to some of these other locations, do you teach people there? How far do you do you spread out the information? Do you want to answer that? Yeah, we our school in Sharon serves. Central Vermont and the Upper Valley regions of Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, we've had students come as far south as Keene, New Hampshire, and as far, from as far north as Montpelier for various programs that we teach there. Uh, the steel drum program, I'd say that primarily they're coming from Central Vermont on a weekly, sometimes twice a week basis to rehearse with Scott and the Panhandlers. And when we travel, we every chance we get, we try to we try to bring our drums with us and, and teach as well. We have done. Some teaching down in Delaware, actually, and that's right. And playing gigs in Delaware and Virginia Beach. Yeah. Well, in our performance range, is pretty much the entire state. The band goes, you know, all the way up north of Burlington and down to Bennington and down to. We've played in Springfield, Mass, and so when we're all, you know, what we really need is the big band bus. We don't have that yet. So we have our, our big band. Is, it's Right now it's 13 members. It's been as high as 22, but you generally have almost that many cars going to every gig because they're packing their, their three big oil drums into their Prius, you know, or trying to. Oh, that's a funny sight. Yeah. <laughs> it is a funny sight. Well, and, and once a year we take our band to the New England Steel Band Festival that happens either in North Conway, New Hampshire, or in Northern Maine. Uh, and it's typically the first Sunday of May right. and they hold it in a hockey arena usually usually and there are about 25 bands from New England that attend and we each play about a 15 minute set of music and then at the end of the day we all play together we play one big mass band piece it gets, so. it gets passed out ahead of time we practice it and then hold on to your hat <laughs> it's loud it's great so you'll have you'll have the director standing in the middle of the hockey rink on a big pedestal with a with a cowbell about this big, you know, <laughs> whacking away at it. And, and the past uh, few years, it's been our drummer Jer that's led the whole the whole crew. We so. have a, a student of Bobby's, yes, Jeremy Kendall, who's only sixteen, and he's just phenomenal. He works. Thanks to works, this man. Works right and here. works and works. Yeah, but he's phenomenal. So he has led the mass band piece a couple of times now. <laughs> Well, that's great. So uh, we're getting to the point, I think, where we need to actually hear some of this stuff, and I'm, I'm sure everyone's waiting for that. Um, so let's do that, and uh, in, just, in just a few seconds, we'll be, uh, we'll be transformed right here. We'll have steel bands galore, steel drums galore, <laughs> and we'll be ready to go. All right? Sounds, Sounds great. great. Sounds okay. great. Let's do it. Terrific. I hope you've enjoyed Chapter 3 of our four-part series. Please come back again next week as we continue our talk with Scott Paulson and Barb Smith on The Drumming Show. Remember, if you want to watch the entire show in one piece as it was originally recorded, please visit us at cnow.tv. That's C-N-O-W TV. If you're listening on the audio podcast and want to reach Scott Paulson and Barb Smith, their email address is V as in Vermont, I-S-A-V-T at AOL.com. That's V-I-S-A-V-T at AOL.com, or reach them by phone at area code 802-234-6987. That's 802-234-6987.